Hello? Hi. My name is Doria. Yeah. Yeah, good. Yeah, you just want to see that. Okay. Hi, guys. Thanks for joining the session. And for all of you who are behind the screen, thanks for joining in. Um, sorry about that. We're running a little bit behind schedule, but we'll just get right into it. Um, so first off, my name is Joaria. I'm the director for Day Science Education at STEM Fellowship. So you guys are going to be hearing a lot from me throughout the challenge. I'll be sending out emails, notifying you of what's going on, things like that. Um, so before we start, we would just like to acknowledge that the land we're standing on today is the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, Huron-Wendat, and the, Pu and the Petun First Nations, the Seneca, the Anishinaabeg, and the, Chip the Chippeway. The, and the Haudenosaunee peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. Um, so first off, I'd like to invite Glenda Casimir, and she has been working at Let's Talk Science as a manager for community development and emerging opportunities. Um, she's completed a bachelor's in ecology, so please join me in welcoming Glenda Casimir. Hey, well, thank you for having us. We're very excited at Let's Talk Science to be partnering with STEM Fellowship to offer a big data challenge. Whoa, that's a large name. Um, <laughs> we think that the uh, group of students that are actually coordinating the event are really enriching the lives of youth, so the ones that are here and listening online, and really showcasing the importance of analytic skills and um, and digital literacy in general, to be honest. Um, it aligns well with Let's Talk Science's work, and we're, we're very excited to be working with them this year and to hopefully help grow um, big, uh, big Data Challenge even further across Canada um, based on some of our networks as well. Uh, just a little bit about Let's Talk Science. So we're a national charitable organization, and we're um, essentially trying to increase youth development through STEM, or science, technology, engineering, and math skills. Um, and and uh, and learning. So we deliver uh, programs, oh sorry, do I use the slides? Can I just click through them? Sorry. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we deliver programs both uh, in person and online. Uh, in person we have about um, 4,000 post-secondary students across Canada and about 48 different universities and colleges that really go face-to-face -to, -face to youth and their educators in their own communities um, to deliver STEM outreach. And we also offer professional learning opportunities to educators in person as well. In fact, we have a big data um, session this year to align that aligns very nicely with the work that's happening here as well. Online, we actually also offer a growing number of programs and resources. Uh, Curio City is actually an example of that. So there's articles, career profiles, videos, and they're all directed to students, typically grade eight to 12. Um, and then we have learning resources for their educators um, in, a, in a login sort of uh, fashion as well that supports that, that um, information. Uh, we also have a number of um, citizen science projects. Uh, so we actually um, are very passionate about bringing research into the classroom and actually having students measure or test or somehow connect to research that's happening um, in sort of the in real life situation. So tomato sphere, for instance, is one of them where we send up tomato seeds onto the International Space Station. Um, it's exposed to space uh, conditions and then students test those seeds um, against control seeds and to see if the germination uh, is affected by it. That information gets to the University of Guelph and others who are actually um, researching that information so that we can see if we can survive on Mars, essentially. Um, so the newest one of those, which aligns really well with the big data challenge this year, is Living Space. So this project is um, really a combination of um, both coding and um, research skills as well. Um, it is 
we're doing it in partnership with the Can Canadian Space Agency and in part uh, funded by the Government of Canada's CAN Code project. Um, it aligns really nicely with the topic that you'll be learning about today that the Big Data Challenge is also focusing on. Um, and really in this, in this project, um, they're using custom sensor arrays and micro bits to measure temperature, humidity, and carbon dioxide conditions in classrooms. Um, they are determining whether they should um, make some sort of intervention within their own classroom settings and then retesting that information. And then they'll be comparing it to the conditions um, on the International Space Station that's being measured by David St. Jacques while he's in space. Um, so they're sort of learning coding along the way using the equipment that we've provided and um, and looking and it's really just another way of looking at environmental conditions and our health um, just like you're going to be doing in this other challenge as well. So really just to that's sort of just a snippet about um, Let's Talk Science and how we got involved with Big Data Challenge and with STEM Fellowship. Um, really that digital skills that you'll be developing through the Big Data Challenge are really critical to Canada's future. Um, analytics, big use, you know, use of big data sets is really crucial in trying to um, come up with the solutions to many of the problems, both critical issues as well as more um, local issues as well. And to be honest, you're um, a small set of students who are learning this who will actually have a lot of uh, skills when you come out of this challenge so that you can apply them to other situations. So thank you for having us. So next up, we have Dr. Daniel Gruner. So Dr. Gruner has 20 plus ex years of experience in working with a variety of programming languages, parallel commuting, scientific modeling, and more. He has a doctorate in chemical physics from the University of Toronto. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Gruner, who is currently the Chief Technology Officer of Scinet right here. Thank you. That CV must be very old because the 20 years have changed into a lot more now. <laughs> I got my PhD about 31 years ago now, so um, but still kicking, and I'm very happy to see you all here. Uh, I don't know how many of you are remotely listening, but welcome and welcome to. Is anybody here a repeat offender? Somebody who's been here before? No, you, not you. I'm, I'm talking about the students. Who uh, have you participated in previous years? All right, so you, I guess you like the, uh, the work. Um, seriously now, uh, this is the fifth year we're doing this, and, uh, and it's been growing, and it's been getting more and more interesting, and the, uh, the results of your work, you know, as, as students taking on the challenge of, of uh, data science uh, are just fantastic. I mean, the insights you gain, the all the thought process that goes in your heads, that's what really counts. And so hopefully you'll be really enthusiastic and, and this today's, I, I don't even know if we have uh, slides about this, but somebody else will tell you more about the, the challenge itself, the data sets that, uh, that you should be working with or the general theme. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a little lost about that. But <laughs> um, I don't know what exactly has motivated you. I would love to hear your thoughts, your, uh, the reasons why you're here, other than maybe, oh, my teacher told me to come. Can you share some, some thoughts, some ideas? Why, why, did, why are you here? Come on, don't be shy. Could be, I mean, you can tell me I'm a geek and I love this stuff, or, uh, or I love the challenge, or I love the theme, or anything. I don't, you know. Prizes. I mean, everything is, yes. <laughs> All right, improve analytical skills. Who else? Which is? Okay, so a data scientist embodying. All right, very cool. Who else? Even if your mom told you, it's okay. <laughs> All right, no sweat. Uh, yes? Great. I mean, so where you end up starting from a pile of data that you don't know very much about 
And then after you analyze it, you produce something, some insight, some report, something useful out of the data. Well, that's great. That's what it's all about. Um, data science, as you know, is, is a growing field. And it's also um, really in need of more people studying this. It doesn't matter what your field of study is. You can be studying humanities or social sciences, and you still need to manage your data. You need to be able to do statistics. You need to be able to understand what's going on. Say, for instance, you're interested in social networks. You know, what good are they besides, you know, seeing pretty pictures of people and food and, and dances and music? There's the insights you can gain from them. You can gain insights from Twitter, from Facebook, from anything, all the information that's around us, and it's humongous. Uh, obviously, we would like to make use of, of the information for the betterment of humanity, the betterment of society. So um, you know, people are using data that's available to understand medical issues, to um, you know, hopefully provide better health care to people, to um, fix what's wrong in cities, you name it. So um, just as a, as a further motivation to, um, to you for the challenge, we've enlisted uh, a startup company who is doing data science and machine learning for health informatics. So I would like to call on Linda to start introducing us to, to Memotex, to A4I. Sure. Oh, both of you, all right. OK. Our slides are uh, here. Your slides, I don't know where this is. Yeah. Uh, all right. Okay, so hello everybody. Um, before we begin, I'd like to say congratulations to all of you to act for actually going, uh, putting yourself into this challenge and taking this upon yourselves uh, to do with the team over the next two and a half months. Uh, I think that deserves a huge pat on the back because I wish when I was, yep, pat yourself on the back, I saw that. Uh, I, th I think that if this was around back when Marina and I were in high school, we would have been really lucky. Um, now you guys are starting earlier and earlier, and data science has just emerged as a really big and promising field, very lucrative field as well. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about how we got into it. So my name is Linda, um, and this is Marina. We both work for a company called Memotext. I'll tell you about that in a second, but a bit about our backgrounds. Uh, I did my Bachelor's of Arts and Science in um, cognitive science at McGill University. Uh, at first, I actually thought I was going to med school. Just like all the other life science kids at one point or another, strive towards med school. That quickly changed. I got into neuroimaging. I started using MATLAB, started, I don't know, liking data exploration. And after completing my bachelor's, I did a certificate in data science at Ryerson. And then right after that, jumped into the Master of Health Informatics at U of T. Um, and now I found myself working for a health technology startup uh, where I'm analyzing data and actually creating an output and influencing people's lives. So I'll just pass it off to Marina to talk about her background. All right. Hello, so I'm Marina. Um, I took a different route uh, into data science as I think uh, right now because it's such a new field, everybody's kind of happenstance falling upon it in a lot of different ways. Um, you guys are lucky that there is actually now programs uh, curated to prepare you for the field and that's, that's uh, really excellent and we wish we probably both had those opportunities in high school. Um, so I went to Queen's University for uh, biomedical computing, so it's a computer science degree, but I focused on like medical imaging and MRIs, radiology, CAT scan, and coding um, interfaces for like surgeons and stuff to use and how they would, um, you know, deal with patients and, and all of that sort of stuff. And then um, I really, really connected with the healthcare aspect of it and how um, how much work needs to be done in healthcare in Canada, even in Canada, um, and all the technology, how far behind we are. So I was passionate about that. And that led me to Master of Health Informatics. So the same uh, master's program that Linda was in, she's one year before me. And then uh, my internship led me to Memotext, and that's how I ended up at the startup. 
Do you guys know what you want to be when you grow up? You said you want to go into data science? Mathematics, yeah. Is anyone else headed towards a data science degree, maybe? No? Hands? Yeah, maybe? Okay, cool. Computer science? Computer science? Yeah. Okay, cool. Many different options. And nowadays, data scientists come from all over, like life side, business, finance. A huge portion are, are computer science as well, apparently. Yeah, yeah. Any field math? Except for us. You know, we, we all came from the hard science. <laughs> and then it happens often. Yeah, physical sciences as well. <laughs> okay, so I'll talk to you about a little bit about what Memotex does. Oh, got animations. Okay, so these are kind of three main things that we do. The first one is digital patient engagement. We basically build um, digital health programs to interact with patients, and we can go through a number of different ways that you see there. We can go through SMS, we can go through email, uh, interactive voice response calls, chatbots, um, et cetera. And so what we try to do, we actually started off as a medication reminder program way back in the day, um, but we've evolved into much more than that. So the stakeholders and the, you know, the customers we work for, um, they, are, they, care things, they care about things such as health coaching, care coordination, so appointment reminders. Um, and so we've worked in a variety of different areas. We've developed these kinds of programs for uh, heart failure patients, type 2 diabetes, glaucoma, um, schizophrenia, I'll get into a little bit more of that later. Um, but the whole, goal, the whole goal of our programs is to digest as much data about the patients as possible and then try to action that data so that they meet some kind of health goal. That second point there, machine learning. So we use machine learning in our intervention design, um, trying to figure out which patient populations we should target. Uh, and then the last one, um, innovation, where we have a spin-off spin -off company called a for i that's App for Independence, where we've created an app to help people with schizophrenia. So basically, we try to partner with um, different health providers to kind of leverage their expertise and create more companies. So that's, those are the three main things. Um, how we do what we do. OK, so the programs I told you about, we kind of follow this methodology here. We start off with targeting. and within that targeting phase, this is where we're applying machine learning and figuring out, okay, who are the patients that actually need our solution? We don't offer you know, our texting program or intervention to just anybody, it's who's, who stands to benefit. And I'll provide an example uh, a little later. The next stage here is personalization. So it's not just a text reminder app. We're using the data about you, whether it comes from um, insurance claims, whether it comes from the electronic health record, from wearables data, your phone data, um, self-reported data, to try to personalize the program to meet your needs. Uh, and then the communications part is all of these different modalities I was talking about. So the SMS, um, IVR, which is the robocalls, um, and then now more recently smart assistants. So Amazon Echo and Google Home are expanding into that space. And we kind of wrap up with analytics and make sure that we actually make customers happy and make them money. Okay, so what do I have here? Okay, so we're taking a whole bunch of different data. You can call it big data, if you will. Um, we have claims data, we have medical data, we have wearables, and we're digesting all of that in our data engine, and we're trying to figure out which data points are relevant for designing our programs. Um, and then maybe we're doing things like, if it's claims data, trying to understand who will deteriorate in their health condition, who's a higher risk patient that we need to offer more supports to. That could be an example of where we apply machine learning. Um, and then we really try to offer those personalized supports. So that's the whole intervention piece there. And one thing I forgot to mention is as the patients actually interact with our programs, um, it's two -way, the two-way communication is taken into account by our end and we'll um, adjust the whole program according to how you respond to it. This is one of our use cases. Um, so this is this was all with claims data. We were looking at who uh, is filling their medication on time. PDC is just proportion of days covered. Don't even know that. That's that just means good medication adherence. The higher you are, the more likely you know you're refilling your medications on time. Um, and we've created different profiles. I don't know if you can see that there of different adherence trajectories. So if we see that someone is coming onto our program and they're more likely to be 
uh, let's say, a, um, okay, a waffler type. Is it up there? No, that's an adhere type. Okay, they're a non-adhere. They have a poor adherence history, and they're predicted to become a poor adhere going forward. Maybe we'll um, use our program to deliver more um, educational content, more um, content about changing their beliefs surrounding their medication, try to get them to take their meds on time. So really try to cater to their needs and help them meet that health goal. And this is the, and I think I have a demo. Oh, no. Okay. Demo should play. No. Okay, this is the company, the spin-off company that we have, a for i So we've developed this mobile health app to help individuals living with schizophrenia and psychosis. And really what we're trying to do is be able to collect enough data about these patients to eventually predict who will relapse and go back into hospital. Um, there's, not a lot of uh, there's not a lot of mobile technology solutions out there for this space, so we're one of the first to be doing so. Um, it's really a support tool for the patients and a way to provide feedback back to the providers um, to tell them how their patients are doing over time. So that's that. I'll pass it off to Marina. Thank you. And so um, I'll talk about a little bit outside of what we do, um, kind of what excites us about data science. So one uh, industry leading example is Netflix. So if you think of the amount of users that Netflix has every day, they have 100 million hours a day of, of people watching their content. The, the search bar is used 3 billion times a day, and 75% of user activity is based on their suggestions. So this is big data. They have so much data available. Everybody from when they pause the video, when they skip parts, when, uh, say, they stop watching a TV show halfway through, all of that's collected and analyzed. And they look for points in the in the video to, so that they can improve their own content and so that they can make better suggestions to the user to get them to watch more content. So having all this data is one thing, but getting meaning from it is, is really the bread and butter of data science. Because you can have a huge thousands of line data set and, and just be staring at it blankly and know nothing from it. So you have to ask questions. You have to have a research mindset. So how many users who started Riverdale from season one finished it all the way to the end of season two? If they stopped, why? Was there, was there a part, what, did it get dry? Did they not like the story, the plot change? And of these users, when did they stop watching? And this helps them make decisions and better decisions to improve their business um, from a private, private standpoint. So if, for example, if Netflix saw 70% of users watched all the seasons available of a canceled show, um, they may consider bringing it back if there's, if there's huge uh, pull for it. If everybody's really enjoying it, it they, they might consider bringing it back. So watch all your favorite shows. They might come back. Um, and so other examples in the industry, um, spam detection uh, for email servers like Google uses spam detection, e emails automatically, you know, advertising, whatever goes into spam. IBM Watson, uh, huge in personalized medicine, actually making, helping physicians and radiologists detect cancer, uh, treat it, clinical pathways. Uh, Facebook with facial recognition, actually being able to tell who's in your pictures before you have to tag them. Uh, and, and Netflix with the content selection and really curating, um, figuring out what people like watching and then suggesting more based on all of the data that they collected. So wh why is it challenging? Well, it's you, it's you can be looking at it very up close or you can be looking at it from different perspectives. So the, all the people around this elephant in this picture have a different, different perspective. The one at the back says, oh, it looks like a rope or it looks like a wall or it's a fan, a tree a house. So it's really hard to take a step back, but this also allows creativity. So everybody will look at a, a, a data science problem from a different angle. Somebody who's in social science or somebody who's in physics or somebody who's in um, math would look at the problem differently. And so it's a great opportunity to work together with people in different fields and also uh, take a step back to see maybe what the root of the problem is or what other questions you can ask about the data set because you're only going to get out the questions that you ask. It's not going to tell you what the, uh, the end result and the meaning is. You really have to ask good questions to figure it out yourself. And that's it. Thank you. Work with part of their. Oh. 
online. Yeah, the question was, what does IBM Watson do? Um, well, for this specific example, they're, they're doing um, oncology, like personalized medicine. So what they did was they trained um, their system on a whole bunch of data, genomic data, medical records. Uh, they worked with physicians. Um, to identify the best treatment options for cancer patients. And they're basically trying to recommend the most optimal treatment pathway given a set of patient data. Um, but they offer different computing abilities or, or technologies. Um, I worked with their cognitive computing system where you can train a Q&A system, kind of like a natural language processing chatbot, uh, which has been leveraged by different companies. And yeah. They have a bunch of different solutions. I don't know if you have anything to add. Yeah. No, I think, I think that was pretty good. But basically, for the, for the oncology thing, the personalized medicine, they're saving um, a team of oncologists weeks um, what, it w what it would have taken them to do to recommend a treatment pathway. What And it only takes about a couple minutes for Watson to figure out what the best route is. I think Part of that also goes into image recognition, so like uh, radiology and x-rays and stuff. So really simple cases where a, f a physician would look at that in 30 seconds and be like, okay, that's a broken bone, that's this, that's this. It, it's being trained. It looks at all, like hundreds and thousands of pictures of the same thing, and it's told that is what this is. Like this is a broken bone, or this is case A, or this is case B. And it can help actually... Um, get rid of those from the, the easy cases, and then the radiologist can spend more time on the difficult cases or the complex cases that the computer may not have seen before or understand. So it's not to say to replace physicians, but also to support them and to make their job easier and reduce um, some of their administrative work that they have to do with the easy cases. So there's, but it, they're doing lots of hackathons because they're, they are big in the field of AI and machine learning and they're, they're industry leaders. They have a lot of money to spend and they're, they're very active in the field for hackathons and stuff. Their hackathons are really great. Um, so it depends on the program, what we're trying to achieve. If it's getting them to be adherent to their meds, they might have a different set of notifications depending on how often they take their meds per day. But uh, we're, not, we're not trying to fatigue them with all these notifications or alerts. We're really trying to contact them at the right time with the right content and you know, to the right put person and the right method. That was a little pitch there for you. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so so. As we learn more about the patient, as they interact with the program, and you know, we see maybe we're collecting wearable data, and, and they're not as active as we'd like them to be, we push out a bit more, um, you know, lifestyle-focused content or activity-focused content that'll help them get more active. Um, so it's it's really personalized to the individual. But yeah, we don't spam. <laughs> yeah. Again, dependent on the program, we've run over 22 different programs. They're, they've started. Some have started as pilot projects for like six months. Um, some have continued on for two years, so anywhere from like 50 people on one program to, you know, to 2,000. But so that's not where the big data is coming from. We're doing independent machine learning as well, um, with you know over I think millions and millions of claim records for um, hundreds of thousands of diabetic patients. So and that one is turning into an intervention. You'll hear about it soon once we go public. Uh, no, not with any of our current. Well, there was one before my time. We did one for glaucoma medication adherence with Johns Hopkins, um, where we were able to see a significant improvement in adherence for people who are on our program. Can't speak much more to that because I wasn't around back then, but. Um, as in with the company. Um, but we're, we're also going to try to do a randomized control trial with our A4I app. So we're going to be working with CAMH. Well, CAMH is actually the partner company of, it's Memotext and CAMH. We've come up with this baby that's called A4I. It's our spin-off company. And we've used their patients to test the app on. And so we're going to have a control group, treatment as usual for schizophrenia, and then schizophrenia with the app and with a provider portal to see if there's a difference.
Okay, just because we're running short in time, we're going to have to move on. So next up, we have Mark Morielli from SAS, and he is the Senior Associate Global Academic Program. No, you're not? Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi. What's that? Yeah, they should be here. For sure, I gave them a bit hello. So... All right, welcome guys online. Hopefully things, you can hear me okay. My name is Mark, I'm from uh, SAS Canada. I'm the national lead for uh, <clears throat> the academic program at SAS, and so it's uh, my job to help people research, learn, and collaborate with our software. And um, so yeah, we're uh, been, is it, it's been five years, Daniel. Uh, we've been, yeah, so we've been this, uh, uh, founding partners for the Big Data Challenge now for five years. It's hard to believe. And uh, seeing this grow from uh, a very small GTA kind of uh, little competition to something that's going now uh, nationally with Let's Talk Science and, and uh, uh, some Calgary work. We're going to be out there in Calgary too. Our Calgary office is going to be hosting some events as well. So it's amazing to see and, and all the motivated students and, and the like. So, um, as so uh, let's see here. So we're just going to go over um, the academic program itself. We regularly, the program itself touches or connects with over 8,000 students a year. And again, our focus is trying to get people to uh, learn and use analytics in their research and et cetera. So, um, and we'll be talking a little bit about things like the um, university edition, uh, which now that's up to 85,000 users here in Canada. And um, we work with over 50, six, almost 60 different degree programs uh, across the country as well. So, um, and definitely the Big Data Challenge is one of them. So the focus for the Big Data Challenge for us is focusing on um, software, uh, getting you guys access to software that is industry standard. Uh, it's, we've been around for over 40 years. We have thousands of customers across the, uh, the world, hundreds in Canada alone. Every single major bank, telco, and retail company uses our software to do stuff like real-time real detection management. So Canadian Tire uses our software to make offers for you on their websites. Rogers does the same for their uh, streaming and networking products as well. Google, Tesla, all the major uh, you know, data science companies that you hear about use our software as well. They're starting to use our software more and more. But so this is where we're going to start with SAS, but we're not stopping with that. So you guys are going to have access to mentors, okay, uh, software mentoring, as well as some prizes and, and, and some cool stuff. And hopefully, uh, as uh, we can't give away money anymore, but we sponsored the program, so there will be some money, cash no prizes for there's no, we're not, There is no SAS dollar figure. We're not allowed. It's unethical. So uh, talk, talk to the lawyers in the United States about that. So. Yeah, yeah. So our first, our first, uh, first is the software, the University Edition. Yeah. So we have uh, over eighty thousand users of this in Canada. This is a free downloadable. Works on all software uh, OS systems, Linux, PC, and Mac. And um, this will be definitely can be a cornerstone for both your analytics and coding computer science programs. It is certainly at Earl Hag. And uh, we're hoping that teachers who are online can connect with us later on and find out how they can use it in their schools as well. OK. Uh, this is very short. We, uh, there is a cloud version of our software that can be made available to you guys as well. It's called SAS On Demand. And I would focus on using the SAS Studio if you do do this. They're limited data storage. It's cloud. I think you only have about five megabytes, five gigabytes of data that's available to you to use on on the uh, on the cloud so but it is an interesting way to to see all the different programs that we use or that we have available so if you guys are wanting to learn SAS both in your school it is uh, still very much the number one analytics skill to have for for if you want to get into business for sure um, it's uh, results in about between 6 and 17 percent increase in your salary so uh, it can be a very interesting thing to have on your, uh, on your uh, LinkedIn profile and on your resume, okay? So that's something. So this is your first start here. 
We have over 12 courses that are made available to you guys. These are professional grade courses where you'd be able to go through and use them, all right? Uh, as well as 200 free training videos. So these are definitely something where you guys, if you want to analyze these uh, large data sets using SAS, you're more than welcome to do so. Uh, very important to note that SAS integrates with open source. And in fact, um, now we have a leading product where you can code in R, Python, Lua, and 30 other different uh, open source languages. Uh, as well. So it's very important to know now that the University Edition will work with the Jupyter Hub, uh, Jupyter Hub and you'll be able to code in R, SAS, and Python, which is a fantastic workbench because um, not all three of these languages are good at everything. And so, but when you combine them, that is a fantastic data science uh, workbench for you. And we definitely have a variety of ways to show you how you can do that right now. So. Uh, certification, we talked a little bit about badges. Uh, these, we now release these to all students and, and people who get uh, certified in our software and you can put them on your, uh, on your LinkedIn profile, which just seems to have taken over this, the resume these days. So, so we've uh, got that as well. So there's other opportunities for you as high school students to get involved in more hackathons and, uh, uh, and research with SAS. Some of them are here. Um, I will talk about the student symposium, which uh, winners of that or finalists of that would get a free trip, hotel, and registration to uh, this year it's Denver. Last year it was, no, sorry, this year it's Dallas. Last year it was Denver. Sometimes it's Las Vegas. This is our, um, you know, our key conference where five to 6,000 SAS users uh, come together and present. And great place for you guys to get internationally networked. Anyways. User groups, if these are also free uh, user groups. Uh, there are three in Toronto alone where you guys can see what data scientists do, where the rubber hits the road, really. It can, they can be a little bit dry. So they get into the coding of their various algorithms and stuff like that. Uh, there are three, I said there's a health one, there is a data science, and then there is a standard SAS user. So there's about 150 to 200 each user group. There's two of them each year. There's free food, free prizes, and things like that as well. So if you're wanting to see and get connected and uh, see what a career in data science is really like, uh, you guys can come check that out too. All righty. So, so some more resources. I am going to bring your attention to this website here, LexJansen.com. This is uh, kind of like a, uh, it's a library of about uh, 10 to 15,000. It's kind of like your GitHub for, um, for SAS. So it has a variety of different uh, specific use cases for SAS and where throughout the businesses and, and it show, it's, it's, it's great. It was very helpful for me when I was uh, uh, a, a coder uh, way back when. I think that there's our connection. So it's very important that, uh, hold on a second. Yeah, that we make you uh, aware. You wanna make sure that the people online and here connect with us We'll connect you with a mentor and help, can help you regularly with your projects. I know Sasha and I have worked with, uh, our data scientists have worked with uh, Earl Haig in the past, as well as a couple other schools in the GTA. We're going to definitely be reaching out with Juaria for the Calgary office as well. They're going to be making their data scientists available for mentoring and things like that as well. So uh, these guys are uh, code in multiple languages. So don't just think it's just SAS. It's going to be Python and R as well, OK? They're going to be methodologically very sound. Most of them have a PhD. And so you're going to be um, in good hands with, uh, con by connecting with us, partnering with us. OK? And that's it. Looking forward to seeing the results. Just to add uh, a minute to Mark's uh, remarks. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, SAS has been a tremendous help in uh, in sponsoring the Big Data Challenge. And there, as he says, their software has been around for a long time. It's not the only thing you can use. You can use any other piece of software. You can use Excel if that suits you. You can use, although I hope you're, you're going to do something a bit more modern. But uh, uh, we, we also have a lot of resources available for you to tap onto. Uh, from our courses at Signet. They're all online. 
with videos, with slides, with, uh, with problem sets. So if you're really keen, you can, you can learn R and Python for data science explicitly from, from our stuff. And we'll be glad to, uh, to point you to that. So without further ado. So thank you, Mark, Dr. Gruner. Um, so now we're just going to take a 10 minute break so you guys can stop on refreshments. And before you guys break, I just wanted to let you know that we are going to be sharing the recording and all the slides that are here so you guys don't need to take pictures or anything if you don't want to. Okay. Yeah. So you guys can go ahead. Open the website. So just as you guys are getting your food, I'd just like to introduce Dr. Sacha Nokovic, and he is basically a, he's amazing. <laughs> he's done a master's in electrical engineering, he's a doctor in management theory, he's a bachelor's of education in communication and media studies. He's basically done it all. And he's been the mastermind behind the Big Day Challenge. He's organized it, he's worked with it, he's created it. Um, so I'm just going to hand it over to Dr. <laughs> Uh, so um, uh, we will take this opportunity while everybody um, kind of, uh, and I understand that the uh, students are coming from school and uh, they're hungry. So while you are uh, trying to replenish your energy, uh, we'll look into the uh, topic of this competition. So um, we came with this, with the idea of this competition together with Let's Talk Science. And as you heard, Let's Talk Science is doing a very interesting um, national uh, research project, engaging students in the life space, uh, practically looking into what are the conditions uh, which will define um, long-term um, cross-planetary, maybe, um, uh, maybe intergalactic flight. What are these um, environment? What are these conditions uh, could be? And this is um, a very interesting and practically, um, I would say, nearly impossible um, question to answer. Especially if you would ask scientists, they have too much knowledge. But it is not a problem if uh, this challenge is given to students because they actually come with a fresh ideas, and that's why. Um, we are um, expanding on this topic and when the most of the experiment and the competition is focusing on the middle school and, experiment and um, elementary school, um, the big data challenge is practically not exactly the similar question. It is a bit wider question. We are asking about living space. Uh, when you are given the data terrestrial data from um, geostatic satellites allowing you to see what is going on on Earth, augmented with all the 
wealth of open data you can find. You can find um, psychological, uh, you can find economical data on the municipal websites. So you can on provincial, federal websites, uh, uh, absolutely great when you simply uh, searching open data Canada, you would uh, be exposed to wealth of absolutely um, data which can lead you in every direction possible. So with all this information in your hands, you are presented a question of big data deter. Um, you know, uh, I, I uh, unfortunately, I would love to speak French. And some French uh, words are really um, inspire me. Um, do you, can you guess where this um, theme came from? What it reminds you? Pomme de terre. Potato. So, um, we actually played with words. We, we took a French expression, uh, well, not expression, a <laughs> French word for potato, and now we have big data deter, which is actually look and through, through a prism of big data on the earth and on the living. And, all, and, the ta and your task is actually to define living conditions, whether they are taken on a small scale, maybe of, um, let's say, um, uh, a family or a small community, or you're looking at the ter uh, territory. And here um, you are provided with the uh, really interesting data sets, of course, starting with Canadian Space Agency, which is involved. Then you are given all the luxury of the NASA and European Agency, which is also uh, what is interesting. None of the data sets in these uh, agencies are really overlap, so you can look at your own focus territory uh, for your, from your own perspective. I would like to point you to specifically uh, UNESCO Biosphere Research because Canada is a home of number of areas which are recognized worldwide as unique and biosphere means that this is not just healthy element of the nature. It is actually self-contained element of the nature, which is a living space of certain significant size for uh, species, for um, uh, endemics, uh, for actually this is biosphere. So when you will be looking at, um, at and defining and going through this data, uh, mining it, Try to find what, try to define your problem um, which relate to you, which is interesting to you. And then everything will converge and then it will be a motivation for you um, to learn um, SAS programming or uh, the follow-up uh, presentation will introduce you to um, resources from Cisco and of course um, you are um, STEM fellowship it will be um, get, getting you into um, uh, the workshops which were developed by students themselves for students on the topics uh, just mentioned uh, here uh, and why I'm so uh, for the students um, or peer mentorship or uh, students for students learning. Uh, because I believe that besides instructor education, you are the first generation which have an opportunity of um, non-course, non-curriculum, non-classroom um, learning and the acquisition of knowledge 
to the extent uh, sufficient practically um, to meet all the expectations. So you are the first generation of learners uh, which, um, which doesn't mean should survive without educational institutes. It's simply <coughs> you are learning differently. And that uh, the whole competition, it is your experience in a new type of thinking uh, when we are declaring uh, that we would like you, if I'm scrolling in the right direction, actually I am uh, going in the wrong direction. No, no again. Uh, where is it? Oh, here it is. Uh, everybody talk about computational thinking. Uh, you do it. Everybody uh, talk about cognitive load management. You have to learn how to do it, or uh, otherwise you're struggling. Um, design mindset. This is what is um, naturally uh, you predisposition to this because you grew up with this amount of data. So um, this is the opportunity for you. Practically, it is a new way of thinking. Uh, what um, this competition or actually life experience. Um, especially designed love experience uh, is um, inviting you to take on. Uh, having said that, and uh, now I see that everybody uh, got whatever they wanted to eat. Uh, I'm um, Jory. You want uh, actually uh, this person I know very well for the. Uh, I don't want to scare anybody with number of years. <laughs> 20 years or something? something 20 years. Okay. Uh, you, uh, you introduce. Uh, I'm just a uh, compliment. Sure, go ahead. So this is Georgie, George? George. So this is George Olnewa, and he's the program coordinator, professor, an author, and an academic lead. He has over 46, experience, 46 years of experience in teaching, um, and he's a professor at George Brown College. Um, 46? 48 in the computer industry. Oh, okay. But, uh, <laughs> I would say 20, 25 years of teaching. I took what was on LinkedIn. <laughs> um, and finally, he's a Cisco ne Networking Academy instructor. So. That's not it. <laughs> that's not the file. That, that one is. Yeah, that one is. 
the mic does not appear to be working though. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's recording. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Yeah. And is there a clicker? No. Oh, okay. No problem. Don't don't worry. Whenever you're ready. Oops. They're still hungry. <laughs> How do you do? <laughs> All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I was uh, asked to come here and tell you a little bit about the Cisco Networking Academy. Um, uh, you've learned about me already, but this is not about me. This is about the Cisco Networking Academy and what it can do for you, um, for some of you anyway, in the future. Um, the, uh, I'm going to go through a brief overview of the Academy program. Uh, the Academy is, is a global uh, learning program uh, organized by, put together by Cisco uh, in its training in information technology. Uh, originally, it trained students in Cisco networking gear primarily. Nowadays, it trains on Python, on Linux, um, on C++, uh, C, um, IoT, it trains students on a uh, much larger variety of topics. Um, so there are about 10,000 academies worldwide, um, and there are about 547 Cisco partners. The Cisco partners are area support centers that support other academies. In my case, uh, at George Brown College, I support uh, approximately 47 other academies. Uh, in, in the GTA, and in fact, there's one academy that's halfway around the world in the island country of Mauritius. I don't know why we, we are supporting them, but Cisco allows it, so we do that. Uh, courses, uh, Cisco Academy courses are delivered online. In fact, the Toronto Public Library is making a number of these uh, self-paced, uh, self well, not self-registered, but self-paced courses available. So if you just check the Toronto Public Library website, you'll see a range of courses that they're offering. Uh, they are now a Cisco Academy, and they're offering a wide range of courses. Primarily self-paced now, they're just about to introduce their Learning Circle courses, which is not going to be, um, be instructor-led, but there is going to be a, a person who took the course already in the room to help the other students around and they're looking to teach more advanced courses with that. Um, the academy, the impact of the academy worldwide is much larger than this, but the academy has impacted Canada uh, in a big way since its inception in 1997. So the academy last year was 20 years old. And I've been, as you heard, 48 years in the computer industry, and I have yet to see curriculum that teaches networking and that teaches other topics as good as the Cisco Networking Academy. Academy trained 27,000 plus students in Canada. Um, 200 plus academies in Canada is about 210 right now. We have 500 instructors in Canada, a total of 200,000 plus students enrolled in the academy. Uh, 27,000 that are current students, 200,000 plus since the inception of the academy. Uh, and about 16% of those are female students. Um, so what the Academy provides, high quality courses, learning tools, uh, a learning ma management system. Uh, for Academies, it provides discounts on equipment so that they can, they can equip labs for the students. And the discounts are fairly substantial. They're in the range of 60 plus percent. So uh, instructor training, uh, instructor training is provided by instructor training centers. George Brown is one of them. In fact, it's the only one in this part of the in this part of Ontario right now, uh, online teaching resources. Uh, you can access your grade book. You can access the online teacher resource from anywhere in the world at any time of the day or night. 
uh, and of course online instructor and student uh, support. Uh, what the organizations that are Cisco Academies and is your school now, Sasha, a Cisco Academy at all? Yeah. The TDSB is an area support center as well. They support all the schools in the GTA. So uh, what the schools provide is classroom space. Uh, there are some private academies as well. There are public academies and private academies. George Brown is a public, and so are the schools, the TDSB schools. Uh, instructor available to receive, instructors available to receive training and to provide training to students. Funds to purchase li lab equipment, students, student PCs so that you can learn, and then internet access with sufficient performance so that you can access the academy. Um, this is um, just a, a partial roadmap of the academy. Uh, the Cisco Networking Academy teaches exploratory courses, and you can see some of them in their introduction to cybersecurity, introduction to Internet of Things. Uh, uh, Linux Unhatched, Be Your Own Boss, Get Connected, uh, to foundational courses such as Networking Essentials, uh, Mobility Fundamentals, Emerging Tech. We have a couple of workshops that uh, talk about network programmability because today networks require a lot of in, in, uh, isolated hardware boxes to build a network. In the future, everything will run off a server and all network configuration will come uh, will be programmatic. So, uh, cybersecurity essentials, IoT security, IoT fundamentals, uh, IoT big data and analytics as well. Uh, um, and then uh, there is a hackathon playbook that supports hackathon for students. Uh, CCNA routing and switching or Cisco certified network associate routing and switching. Uh, and a number of other courses. Uh, a lot of these courses, the Python courses, for example, and the C courses are created. The C courses are created by the, CIS, the C Institute, and the Python courses by the Python Institute. The NDG Linux courses follow the Linux Professional Institute uh, certification track and so on. Um, there's just a quick description. There's a lot of text in here. I'm not going to try and read it for you. Uh, this information is available online on the net. It's netacad.com on the Networking Academy site. Uh, there's course resources in there. Um, so uh, the Python, uh, the programming essentials in Python, and there is an, a more advanced Python course in development right now. Uh, IoT fundamentals, connecting things. Uh, Cisco provides a prototyping lab that you will see coming up in a future slide, but there's a prototyping lab that works um, works together with Raspberry Pi and Arduino uh, uh, and sensors and things uh, and IoT big data and analytics. Um, sorry, let me just go. Uh, Cisco has a packet tracer which is a network simulator. Uh, the network simulator started out being able to simulate only networks. Nowadays you can add IoT uh, devices, you can add single board computers, you can add uh, microcontrollers like the Arduino. Uh, and when you add those, you can also add sensors connected to these devices. Not only that, but you can program in Python and JavaScript within Packet Tracer without ever touching a piece of hardware. It's a really, really nice simulator. So it works really well. If you register in Networking Academy, you can download a copy of Packet Tracer for free. You need an account in the Networking Academy, but you can download a, a copy of Packet Tracer for free, experiment with it. You can experiment with a single board computer without ever touching. You can prototype your, your, your device with sensors and everything without ever touching a, a hardware, a piece of hardware. Uh, there's the Cisco Prototyping Lab, which is, uh, which, uh, is available with the Connecting Things course. Uh, and allows you to connect uh, Raspberry Pis um, and Arduinos, and uh, it makes it a lot easier to program. You can program with uh, Blockly, you can program in Python, you can program in JavaScript, uh, and you use the prototyping lab with real devices, with real hardware, single board computers, and Arduino microcontrollers as well. Uh, to get started, uh, if, you, if there's anyone here that would like to become an academy, um, that's, you know, become an academy under netacad.com. As a student, 
you can just go to netaccad.com, uh, register to create an account, and you'll be able to download Packet Tracer free of charge. Um, when you run Packet Tracer for the first time on any computer that you install it, and you can install it on as many as you want, but the first time you run it, you need an account to log in. After you log in on that computer, then you don't have to do that ever again. Okay. Uh, so just just gives you a quick overview of the Cisco Networking Academy and what it can do. Feel free to go there and take a look around and see what you can find. There are some self-registered, self-paced courses. Uh, Check T Toronto Public Library as well. Uh, those courses at the Toronto Public Library are all free. Um, and they are beginning to teach courses that are instructor-led as well. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yes? I don't remember. I don't remember if C Sharp is supported. I, as a matter of fact, no, I know. C Sharp is not supported. C may be supported, or C++ may be supported, but not C Sharp. Yeah. Well, the Arduino programming, native programming language, which is called processing, is based on C. So, no, no C Sharp. It's based on C. <coughs> yeah. But it can be programmed in, uh, in the prototyping lab, you can program it in JavaScript and Python. Uh, you may be able to program it in C as well. Uh, in real Arduino, I've never seen an Arduino. Uh, actually, that's, that's, it is possible to program an Arduino in JavaScript or in C as well. No, you can, but not with the Arduino IDE. You can, but with different IDEs, not with Arduino. So. Supports C, yeah, C++, and supports processing as well, which is based on C. Any other questions? Good. Thank you for your attention. You have a copy of the presentation over there. Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay, so this is where the slides are going to slow down a little bit because this is where we're going to break down how the challenge is going to work. And feel free to just stop us if you have any questions. Um, so I'm just going to pass it on to Caitlin, who is an executive at STEM Fellowship. She's working as part of the data science team, and you'll be hearing a lot from her as well. All right, thank you, Joria. Uh, is the mic working? Okay, sounds good. Oh, okay, sounds good. Sorry. Uh, yeah, I'll just start. Okay, so now that you've heard from some of, our, some of our partners about the workshops and the resources that you're going to have access to, let's take a look at what the timeline looks like from now to the end of the competition, right? Because I think that's what everybody's interested in. So essentially, we're in like the pre-competition um, dates right now. This is when you have the orientation. And after today, you'll be invited to register online at Eventbrite to register your team and pay the registration fee. So the deadline for registration is October 20th, and then thereafter, you'll start collaborating in your teams of two to four um, and developing your projects with access to the data sets and starting to actually put together your projects. Um, and on January 19th, that's when your reports are due. So every group is required to put together a scholarly report to submit to a, our panelists to review them. And it, within the weeks of uh, January 22nd to January, uh, January 9th, that's when our um, panelists will be re reading your reports and essentially grading them and evaluating them. So when we get to February 4th, that's when the finalists will be announced. And we have 10 finalists for Toronto and 10 finalists for Calgary um, who will be invited to Big Data Day. Just to backtrack, um, regarding the review of the project submissions, they'll be done by a panelist of PhD reviewers. So um, we will be providing you with the appropriate um, report writing format so you don't lose marks there. Yeah, and I believe a rubric will also be provided to you on what criteria these individuals are looking for. So then after the finalists are announced on February 4th, um, you'll have to prepare an oral presentation for Big Data Day on February 21st in which you'll present your project. 
All right, so the registration process is fairly simple. You um, try to find a team of two to four. We encourage you to work within teams because we think there's something to be gained through the collaboration process, and we believe that you can put together a better project when you have more people to sh share ideas and kind of bounce off of. So that's why our minimum is two people and our maximum is four members, just for um, facilitation of that. All right, so you can go to our um, STEM fellowship website under the data science education tab, and you can check the big data challenge for high school students. And underneath there, you may have already taken a look at our website already to register for this orientation. And at the bottom of the page, there's the challenge registration. And if you click that link, it'll lead you. Oh, I guess we don't have a picture of it. OK, it'll lead you to our Eventbrite page, essentially, where the price to pay for an entire team is $125. So whether you're registering a team of two or a team of four, it's $125, which is including tax. And on the Eventbrite page, you'll provide information about each individual member of your team. All right. So the data and tools that you'll have access to will be distributed through a Google Drive. That's where we'll be um, sending you, well, I guess sharing you the data sets that we've provided from our partners from the Canadian Space Agency, ESA, and NASA. Oh, yeah, you can see them on the next page. Um, and essentially, that's where we'll be putting any tools or resources that you'll need. Additionally, we'll have our workshops on GitHub, so you can access those as well. And we'll be communicating with you guys through Gmail at the, in the beginning of the competition, but then afterwards we'll move to Slack where we'll be doing a lot of the collaboration and feedback um, there. So there will everybody, all the, um, all the participants will be there where you can um, communicate to each other, get feedback on some of your code, and to collaborate with others and get some advice. So regarding mentors, we'll have not only data science experts to help you out with the coding process, but also some experts in the theme. So maybe climate change or biosphere reserves. Um, and those will be available to help you get started in your research process. Because we know that not all of you will be familiar with the theme to, from the beginning. So moving on to the data science workshops. So throughout the challenge, we'll be having workshops all the way until November. And the majority of our workshops are in R and Python, but we'll also have a SAS workshop and a workshop in Tableau. Um, so our introduction to statistics will simply be a document which you would be expected to read over. Um, it'll be a good introduction to simply how the data science process works. Um, and then following that, um, the second week of the challenge, we'll introduce data manipulation, and that'll be in R and Python. Then we'll have data visualization, and again, this will be in R and Python. And we're also going to be having a data visualization um, workshop in Tableau, simply because um, it is a useful tool to have, especially if you are a beginner in the data science process. Um, it will help you see how your data is going to turn out um, in an easier format, since it is very user friendly. And then finally, we'll have a basic machine learning um, workshop. Um, most of you should be able to get to that level, and perhaps even beyond. And as she mentioned before, all of our workshops are going to be delivered through the GitHub platform. We will have, we will have webinars. And um, for the SAS workshops, we'll have an additional webinar. And that's being developed by one of our own team members. Again, all these workshops are delivered by our team. And these are all students, so we know what you need and what will help you understand the process. Um, and then finally, we're also going to have an Overleaf workshop. So Overleaf is basically a collaborative Word document platform. The cool thing that I find about this is that you can code the design of your report. Um, it gives you more freedom as to the layout, and it gives you more space. That's my main <laughs> um, pro to it. Um, and then Big Data Day would be the culminating event. And just go on. Um, basically, how it's going to work is you're going to first submit the scientific reports, and that would be February 20, no, not February, uh, January 19th. And that'll be via Overleaf. Once that's done, as we mentioned before, it'll be reviewed by PhD reviewers, and we'll pick out the top 10 finalists for each location. So this year, you guys might have seen, we have the BDC happening physically in Toronto and Calgary. Um, and then finally, at Big Data Day, you're going to be delivering um, a 15-minute presentation, which will be judged by um, our panel of judges, and there'll be various um, experts. So not only experts in data science, but also in the theme, again. And this year, we're also going to be providing travel grants. Um, and this will be distributed on a needs-based basis. And it'll only be for um, the to and from the Big Data Day. 
um, and I've mentioned this before. And both our venues will be hosted by SAS. In terms of resources, again, our workshops will be delivered via GitHub. We will also have a secondary platform, which you can use, and we'll get into that right after. It'll be the Jupyter Hub platform. Um, and we'll also be providing you with past um, papers for you to read over to see what other people have done in the past, how they've won, what the winning teams um, did through their data science process. In terms of prices, we'll have, oh, it's supposed to be 1,000. <laughs> um, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so SAS will be providing 2,000 overall, so it'll be 1,000 for Toronto and 1,000 for Calgary, and they'll be doing it for the Analytics Talent Award. So it's not a first, second, third place um, breakdown, but it's based on um, the category that you've excelled in. And then we'll be having two prizes from RBC, and that'll be in recognition of Arnold Chan. Arnold Chan was an MP, and he passed away last year. And then we'll have one more um, prize from Digital Science, and that'll be your Scholarly Communication Award. Digital Science is basically, um, they, ha they, look over they overarch Overleaf, so Overleaf is under them, if that makes any sense. <laughs> yeah. And now I'd like to call up Dr. Ren. Um, he spoke about the data sets before, so you guys are probably familiar with the data that we're going to be providing. Um, uh, you know, uh, when you will be on Slack, uh, when you will be starting, um, let's say, your research, it is always a challenge how to ask the question, how to present um, yourself to the expert, how to, how to start speaking on the topic uh, of your interest. So uh, to help you in this, on this matter, um, with the uh, assistance of um, previous year participants of um, Big Data Challenge, we developed something which was called Rabbit Hole of Knowledge, the tool which would allow you to actually do the following. Rabbit Hole of Knowledge is a new type of educational tool that creates an uh, environment for student-driven personalized learning on one side. It provides an opportunity to, uh, to pick up and follow individual learning paths and corresponds with student learning style preferences. It builds upon um, uh, and stimulates uh, logical and associative uh, connection as well as academic curiosity. So having said these all nice words about in the kind of in uh, attempt to promote the tool which um, I'm instrumental to, I would like to tell you what this tool is really does. Um, it is, um, it is this slide is also about how good is the tool and, um, and how, uh, how much you can benefit from this. Uh, let me uh, practically tell you what the tool uh, does. So when you put into this, uh, and um, when you go to this um, rabbitholeofknowledge.com um, and uh, click on the um, start button, you are getting uh, into the search window and putting your, let's say, topic of interest. Uh, following this topic, the tool will go and find through the biggest databases of uh, scholarly publications, the highest relevant um, papers um, on this topic. So practically, we are working with Altmetric and dimensions, the databases which are um, also following the impact factor of the research. So you, uh, the tool will pick up the most impactful research. But instead of dumping on your poor heads uh, this scientific language and all the power of academic research, the tool finds internet reflections. It finds blog posts, it finds um, YouTubes, it finds uh, news stories which followed these academic papers. And as a result, 
you have presented the rumors of the biggest academic research papers on the topic, which would allow you to get your own idea of this topic, to get y yourself into the language of this um, subject matter, and prepare you to ask questions, and to prepare you to go further. Uh, because every link which will, will be there will have actually a hyperlink to the original research paper in case you would like to go further and deep. Uh, the way you will see um, tool presenting everything to you will be in a form of a word cloud like this. And you will in, there will be any guidance for you uh, which one whatever word will kind of resonate with you, with you, you will click on it. And it will, you will click on one, you will click on another. And practically, this is the way how you can get started. And that is the purpose of this tool, to get started uh, on the uh, topic and get ready to start asking questions in terms and uh, with the language appropriate uh, to expert you would like to reach to. So um, rabbitholeofknowledge.com. And on this note. OK, so our last speaker for today is Farouk Kaiser. And basically, um, we've developed a platform, Jupyter Hub, which you guys can use to do all your coding on. I'll just let him talk about it. So. Hi guys, uh, just to quickly introduce myself, I'm Fruit Kaiser, I'm a data engineer with BBM, I lead Data for Good in Toronto, and I've been asked to help out STEM Fellowship by building them a Jupyter Hub platform that will help you guys be able to actually do your coding in Python, R, or whatever, without actually having to install anything on your local computers. Oh, okay. Um, so, if you didn't understand much of that, don't worry, I'm gonna walk you guys through the platform, but essentially everybody is gonna get a username, login, and password, and you're gonna log in through here. Uh, so I have a team set up called Team One, and I won't say the password. Essentially, you would log in through the platform into here, and it would bring you to a screen sort of like this. Uh, this is what's known as Jupyter Lab. Some of you may have previously used Jupyter Notebooks. This is like the next generation version of that. Um, just to walk you guys through what the different parts of the screen mean, this here is sort of like your navigation pane um, where you'll have sort of all of your files listed. Uh, you, can have, you can make new notebooks from here. So for example, you can create a Python notebook if you want. You can create a Julia notebook, which is a very new language being used by MIT. Or you can create an R notebook. So I'll go ahead and create a quick Python notebook right here. Uh, and we can now start typing some code in. So some really basic code, one plus one equals two, as you'd expect. You can do something teensy bit more complicated. We can ask Python to print hello world. And it'll do that. So that's Python. And note, this is all running in your web browser. It doesn't matter what kind of computer you have. It can be Mac, it can be Windows. You could even run this on your mobile phone if you wanted to. I was using it on the way here to get this stuff set up. And just to demonstrate for learning purposes, this now is an R notebook. You can tell because it's using the R kernel here. And you can do something similar. Again, 1 plus 1 is the same in Python and R. You get that. You can try to do something a little bit more complicated. I'm typing with one hand. We can create a data frame, which some of you may know is a type of structure in R that's used for organizing your data. 
we'll create a table that has two columns, both of which are filled with one and one, two and two. The data frame's been created. Let's see what that data frame actually looks like. There you go, you have a table there. And we can now do even more cooler stuff, like actually create a visualization using the famous ggplot2 library in R. And I haven't done this in a while. Basically, we're passing in the data frame object. There's going to be a bunch of cool tutorials for you guys to learn how to do all this. And we'll tell it to create a line graph. And hopefully, I've gotten everything right there. And you have a line graph. Ooh. You have a graph, but without the line. Sorry, what's that? Um, is this, uh, why does it work? Have every single length one real quick? Basically, yeah. Uh, in this particular, you can pick for each notebook which language you want to code in. So this notebook works using, is only going to run R code in here. You can't run Python code in here. If you want to create a uh, Python notebook, you need to go back to the front screen and create a new Python notebook. Yeah. Oh, yeah, please feel free to interrupt me if you have questions. So that's the first thing. Uh, you'll all get this link to be able to connect up to this platform as well as login details at the start of the competition once you've signed up. Uh, if you feel more comfortable using the more classic interface, that's also available. I don't recommend it. It looks kind of ugly. Uh, but that's there as well. You can also upload data onto this platform. It's pretty easy. In this old interface, you just click the Upload button. And I don't know if there's a file here that I can just upload. Mm. OK. I don't see any files. I'm not going to go looking through somebody's laptop. Uh, but yeah, you can upload data, and it will be automatically available to you guys in here as well. And that's basically it. It's just supposed to work. Uh, if you have any sort of trouble or issues with this platform, you're going to be able to reach out to me directly or to one of the mentors. Also, if you're writing code uh, and you are struggling with some particular syntax or some command isn't working for you, you can also really easily share the notebook with somebody else. Click this button. It'll give you a shareable link. Now you have the link. You can go give it to anybody else, and they can automatically get access to your notebook. So we're going to try and do that here. One sec. And they'll have to log in, and they can access the notebook as well. But you can uh, get help from your mentors directly through here. Any question? So two people can work at the same time. Two people. Oh, no. Two, two people can work on this at the same time. So if you're on a team of three people, you can all log in at the same time. And you can code side by side if you want. While you're not near each other either. Yeah. You're, the idea for this was to give you guys, each member of the team, the same login, username, and password. But it is possible to give people individual accounts. I don't think that would be particularly useful if you're on the same team. Because right? the idea is you all would work on the same notebook, probably. Any other questions? The other cool part about this is all of the materials, like the GitHub workshop materials, will be available directly on this platform. It will be in this. It will be in a folder like this, 2019 BDC Workshops. And every time you log in, it will be automatically updated with the latest material. So if you're now in week 10, maybe we'll have week 10 materials up here as well. And actually, this is a great place to show you guys some of the other stuff this can do. There, You can also open up data in here. So this is showing you the actual Excel file that's being provided with this challenge, I guess. You can open up pictures. So if you're doing some kind of image type analysis, you can upload pictures onto here and then start analyzing it right in here. Uh, and then, of course, you can open up one of the example workshops. So here's one of the workshops that's provided. It's, I think, very preliminary, week two data handling. If all the data is here, we can end up reading it. No, oh, the data isn't provided here. Let's see if there's one that actually has data with it. Yes, it is Google Cloud. OK, here's a PDF that we've got as well on here. 
Anyway, that more or less covers it. Um, that's really all I want to share. Does anybody have any other questions? Nope. Oh, fantastic. You guys, have good luck with the competition. So just one side note, all our workshops are going to be available through here. So you can simply run them directly through the Jupyter Hub platform. You won't need to download them or anything. Um, and that brings us to the end of our orientation session. Do you guys have any questions at this point? Yeah. Do you get access to this class through Whitehead? Uh, right now, no. We're going to give you access to it once you join the competition. Okay. Yeah. October 21st. Yeah. Um, there's no questions. Okay then, I guess that's it for today. Uh, Dr. N, would you, you like to close it off? So as you see, um, uh, <laughs> as you see, all the uh, workshops um, will be available on uh, GitHub. Uh, there are wealth of resources um, which are provided uh, by SAS and uh, learning uh, videos and curricula um, pro to learn uh, SAS programming. Uh, there are also resources uh, similar to um, help with the um, Python and R, which can be accessed through SciNet uh, from University of Toronto. Uh, overall, um, we are uh, adding on this platform because it is uh, practically a way to put everybody on the same platform, regardless of your um, tool, regardless of your device you have. So all the teams will practically uh, be um, on equal ground um, with this platform. Um, if they want, they will have... Uh, access to um, to the tool set simply online uh, with either even chromebook or tablet uh, or cell phone um, anywhere in canada so um, one of the uh, new goals of our competition we want to bring in uh, into a big data thinking uh, wide audience uh, beyond big cities and um, this is a way uh, to look into. Once again, I would like to draw your attention to the topic of our competition, uh, which is a life space. So think about it. What is your um, space you are living in? What, how big it is? What are the critical components? And with this question, or uh, it can be a question you can be looking not just at uh, where you live um, physically. You can be solving a problem um, globally. You can be addressing somebody else's concerns um, and practically coming with solutions um, for international problems. So um, whenever you feel a critical uh, topic, that is the opportunity to um, address it, and it is uh, goes from the health issues uh, to humanitarian um, issues. So the scope of this life space goes uh, from sustainable development and environment uh, to society so and economy. So all inclusive. Uh, or if you would like to get focused on some specific uh, field, uh, that is your opportunity. So um, simply to add on, um, I don't know, it, it's probably maybe I simply need to reemphasize uh, the overleaf. It is the academic um, world recognized scholarly collaboration and writing platform. So for all the participants in uh, the competition, their abstracts are published. So you are getting your first scholarly publication by simply participating in this and coming to the uh, end uh, with the research project submitted. And of course, uh, we encourage you to get your projects uh, to the level when they will be selected by, um, um, let's say, uh, biggest experts. So we we hope and we have um, we were.
assured by NRC, uh, we, um, uh, like you heard, we are assured by SAS, we are assured by our uh, friend here at Sinet. Um, they all will be involved in a review of student papers, something what is not always available even for university research. So on this note, I'm, um, I'm inviting everybody to form the teams. Uh, because teams, it is a way of winning. Uh, I highly respect the intellectual capacity and abilities of every participant of uh, this competition. But uh, this world is built on the crowdsourcing of knowledge. And when you are a team, your task is much easier. So based, well, on this note, I'm inviting everybody to register and uh, join the competition. Thank you. So that's it for today, guys. Feel free to stick around and talk to any of us if you have any questions. And yeah, thanks for coming in. Uh, just use all tabs. So.